Thank you for tuning in. My name is Bogdan Dragnea and I will present recent research from my lab at IO Bloomington on superfluorescent virus-like particles. There are two main research directions in my lab. The first concerns thermoplasmonic interactions between nanoparticles and their environment. The second deals with biomimetic, biotic, abiotic nanomaterials, an example of which I will describe here. The biological component of the hybrid photonic nanoparticle we have developed is borrowed from a virus. In its most basic description, a virus is made of a protein shell and a nucleic acid molecule, or molecules, which are encapsulated, protected, and delivered by this protein shell. Viral cages have outstanding physical properties. Some can withstand very high temperatures or very low temperatures, even vacuum, um, or very high pressures. Therefore, the protein cage is of interest from a materials perspective and, of course, from a biomedical perspective, because as of yet, we do not have ways of identifying viruses outside the host and no ways of interfering with the self-assembly process. One appealing feature of working with viruses is that many virus particles can be reconstituted in the lab from a subset of their components. For instance, uh, virus shells could be spontaneously self-assembled from protein subunits in certain conditions. Um, moreover, a higher scale organization can be achieved in similar ways as it is with inorganic nanoparticles. Uh, to the right here, the herringbone pattern was obtained by crystallizing tobacco mosaic virus um, as early as 1941 by uh, J.D. Bernal. Another appealing feature is that uh, viruses occur in many different architectures, and shapes, and sizes, which is fascinating because they don't have a metabolism. And so viruses, all viruses must self-assemble. Many viruses have symmetric, remarkably sized monodispersed shells. Assembling many copies of the same protein into a protein cage leads to symmetry. This is economical since the genome has to encode for a single code protein and thus uh, can be kept small. The regular polyhedron with the highest volume to surface ratio is the icosahedron. About half of the known RNA viruses have an icosahedral capsid. Code proteins are organized as pentamers or hexamers in such a capsid. Uh, a cage with icosahedral symmetry requires 12 pentamers at the vertices, but the facets can have a variable number of hexamers, and so this is the principle which allows for variation in the cell shell size according to the genome length. Our lab has uh, studied the physical and chemical processes that lead to spontaneous cargo encapsulation inside uh, icosahedral virus cages. Nanoparticles with interesting optical or magnetic properties were functionalized with a polyanionic coat, which mimics some of the properties of the native genome, specifically electrical charge and steric properties. Because of the acquired chemical resemblance to RNA, these nanoparticles co-assembled with virus code proteins and formed shells of a magic number of proteins. The magic number and the structure can be identical with that of the wild-type virus, like in the gold nanoparticle encapsulated in uh, this red-colored protein code to the right at the top of the slide. However, magic numbers and structures can also be controlled according to the size and shape of the nanoparticle, like it is shown in the, at the bottom row of the slide. In this talk, I will present recent work aiming to harness the structural fidelity of self-assembled virus-like particles to control collective relaxation dynamics after photo excitation. We are currently studying two instances of collective uh, relaxation dynamics. 
uh, it left a capsule decorated with fluorophores, um, organic dyes, which being very close together, couple and relax uh, radiatively and coherently. At the right, uh, we see the fluorophore array now can couple not only to a radiation field, but also to a bound electromagnetic mode, uh, one of the surface plasmons of the nanoparticle inside. In both processes, if, the if there is fluorophore coherence, uh, we expect the relaxation rate to depend on the number of fluorophores non-linearly, which opens the way to more efficient radiation or plasmon exci excitation processes. And by contrast, uh, for an incoherent process, we expect emission intensity to be linearly dependent on n, the number of dyes. You may wonder why exactly using a nicosahedral virus instead of a, just a randomly um, organized molecular coat. We use a virus shell because we can put the molecular emitters at precise reproducible locations on its surface and the orientation of these molecular emitters would reflect the symmetry of the, of the virus shell. This is important because near-field coupling varies very strongly uh, with distance and, and um, orientation. So, moreover, a, a well-defined symmetry can help selecting one of the resonances of the nanoparticle, as illustrated in, in this cartoon, uh, and by the color map um, illustration as well of a particular surface plasmon mode which has the same symmetry as the protein shell. And so the underlying idea is similar we believe to that of a phase array antenna to the right um, which is a way to generate a bright radar beam from a coherent ensemble of coupled dipole antennas. In terms of applications we believe such uh, hybrid particles could be useful to biomedical imaging applications and for the generation of hot electrons uh, for photocatalysis in a way that is reminiscent of photosynthetic systems. Today's presentation is about uh, accelerated emission from an array of uh, virus-supported dyes. Results from plasmonic coupling will be presented at another time. We use a bromosaic virus shell as scaffold we conjugate a uh, rhodamine dye, Oregon green, to the exposed lysins on the capsid. The fluorophore scaffold is borrowed from the bromosaic virus, which has a capsid diameter of 28 nanometers. The conjugation does not change the structure of the template. However, clearly, the Oregon green dyes interact strongly with the capsid since we observe stiffening and improved resilience after conjugation. We control the average number of dye labels by reaction time, and we monitor the number of dyes by UVVIS absorption spectroscopy. Spectra acquired at different number of dyes are shown in graph A on the left. The spectral signature observable on these spectra of the virus-supported dyes is very similar to that of the free dye. This means that uh, the dyes are spaced enough um, relative to each other to avoid molecular aggregate formation. But the fluorescence on the right graph shows concentration quenching. So with an increase in the number of dye, in photon, the number of photons emitted decreases. This is due to dye proximity by the homofret effect. This is a slide just to remind you how the Forster Resonant Energy Transfer, or FRET, works. When one dye is excited, the excitation energy can couple into a neighboring dye in the ground state. In other words, light absorption does not result in fluorescence, and as the energy is trapped inside the fluorophore array, it can relax non-radiatively, and so fluorescence is quenched. This happens at steady state excitation. But what happens if we excite many dyes at the same time? In this case, neighboring dyes may be excited simultaneously. Lateral energy transfer cannot occur, but the dyes can exchange pairs of virtual photons due to proximity, just like in during van der Waals interactions. That has implications for the rate of emission, as we shall see in the next slide. Here we show a comparison 
of essentially the relative quantum yield of dilabeled viruses under pulsed and continuous wave excitation as a function of the average number of dyes per capsid. Clearly, there is suppression of fluorescence quenching for a dye load of more than about 180 dyes per capsid. This suggests that radiative processes at high number of dyes become much faster than non-radiative relaxation. To test this idea, we have measured uh, emission dynamics with a streak camera at Argonne National Lab. The graph shows fluorescence emission from uh, virus-like particles as a function of time. It occurs as a 25 picosecond burst instead of a smooth exponential decay of about 4 nanoseconds, as can be seen for the free dye in green. The emission is delayed by about 20 picoseconds with respect to the femtosecond excitation laser pulse. We hypothesize that the 100 times increase in peak intensity is due to a collective effect because it depends non-linearly on N. The virus template is involved in several possible ways. Um, in this slide, I present an indication that the dye's optical properties are extremely sensitive to modulations in scaffold characteristic lengths. When doing transient absorption measurements of the excitation relaxation time, we observe oscillations in the transient absorption signal of about 40 picosecond period. We don't see such oscillation from free dye in solution. They must therefore relate to the virus scaffold. If these are capsid phonons, then the transient absorption modulation suggests an exquisite sensitivity to distance and tight interaction between the dyes and the capsid. We have performed single particle fluorescence lifetime microscopy, which confirmed that photon emission rate is accelerated at a single particle level. Uh, this way we know that it's not an effect coming from particle aggregates or, or a similar artifact. Moreover, there is a power density threshold of about 15 microwatt per micron square, below which the effect disappears. This indicates that a critical number of dyes must be excited simultaneously for the effect to occur. In conclusion, fluorescent virus-like particles offer a new paradigm uh, for multi-emitter luminescent nanoparticles, which we believe is worth continuing studying and uh, improving. And um, thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions.